Aloha and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Dwayne Barone. I am the founder and executive director of Students and Athletes for Healthy Relationships, also known as stars.org. I am thrilled and honored to be joining you as a contributor and collaborating member with Michelle DeMuria, founder and executive director, of course, of the Be Daring Foundation. And I am honored to be able to share information from my professional experience, which spans nearly 35 years in mental health and human services. Um, today, I plan to share with you information from a PowerPoint presentation called Understanding Interpersonal Violence. And hopefully, I can provide information that helps you gain new perspectives and understand the concept of emotional intelligence and interpersonal relationships. As you can see, uh, it says here that hurt people hurt people, even when that feels like love. Um, one of the things I have found from the clients I've worked with is no matter what they had looked for in relationships, often things from their past came into it and caused problems. So we are all unique human beings. We all have our own life story. Um, it's aspects and details of those stories that shape and influence what we believe to be true in relationships, what we expect from relationships, how we're supposed to react, etc. So we're unique as human beings, but also at the same time, we're typically very alike. Um, you are the bucket, as it says, and this is your emotional bucket that's filled with your life experiences. <clears throat> This has to do with parent-child relationships, has to do with sibling relationships, peers at school, etc. So again, what do you want from your relationships? What do you think are your basic human needs? I ask these things because in my field, in my work, I have noticed that it's all about relationships. And our lives are filled with relationships. How many different relationships do you think you can identify? I'll give you a few seconds. Well, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we have our parents. We may have siblings and our extended family. Unfortunately, with high levels of divorce, that means we often have step parents. We may have half brothers. We may have step brothers and sisters. Um, some are going to be older, some are going to be younger. Neighbors are part of our relationships, friends at school, even teammates if we got involved with sports. And definitely we're talking about partners. And as you can see here it says stop domestic violence. Well. Over the last 20 years, I've focused in on domestic violence treatment. I have worked with folks who have been arrested and placed on probation because they pled guilty to charges or they went to trial and were found guilty. The fact of the matter is domestic violence comes in many different forms and fashion. And most people want to think it's absolute extremes where it's about black eyes and broken noses. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that happen within relationships where they're feeling caustic, where they're toxic. And those things also typically come into form things like verbal, mental, and emotional abuse. <clears throat> so what are the patterns? What are the patterns that you notice in the relationships that you've been involved in? How are they similar from one relationship to the next? How may they be different? How are they similar to the relationships you had in, parent, in childhood with your parents? Again, how might they be different? Who is currently involved in your life and who might be missing? Because one of the things that I have found is that people missing in our lives may cause us to hold on to relationships past their sell-by date, as I like to say. 
because we have a hole in our bucket and we are looking to hang on to relationships so that we can feel complete, so to speak. So why are we so alike? Well, here's that hole in the bucket. It's the things that hurt us as human beings. That's what tears the hole in the bucket in the first place. And this is my hole in the bucket theory. That that hole is caused by the traumas, hurts, and pains. That can be things like parental fighting. It can be siblings being abused or disciplined, of course, which may be excessive and harsh. Sometimes, of course, we've experienced bullying at school, like I did, or it may come from our siblings themselves. A lot of times there's issues of abandonment, and abandonment can come from divorce, and our parents remarry sometimes, or sometimes after divorce, a parent absolutely disappears from our life. Clearly, death can cause a hole in the bucket through abandonment, but unfortunately, with the clientele I've worked with, uh, too many parents ended up in prison or were part of gang membership. Um, sometimes, as a child, somebody has gotten involved with gangs until they eventually get out of them. Addictions and mental health issues cause those abandonments and other hole-in-the-bucket theories, and then also being abused and then clearly neighborhood safety issues. A lot of the people I've worked with would not exactly say that they grew up in a very safe and comforting neighborhood. So basic human needs. What do you think are your basic human needs? One of the great thinkers in our field, Abraham Maslow, came up with his hierarchy of needs. And as you can see here, at the bottom are physiological needs such as air, water, food, shelter, sleep, clothing. There's safety needs. We need to feel safe as human beings. We need to feel protected. There's love and belonging, where we need friendships. We need to have intimacy. We need to have a sense of connection, especially with our families. Next is, of course, self-esteem, self-respect, self-confidence. And then clearly at the top is self-actualization, which really is our ability to reach our full potential and often to pass that on. Why do I bring this up? Well, let me ask you a question. As a baby, when somebody is growing up in a home where we have something like parental addictions, there may be a lot of violence that's going on in that family. And if there isn't, and of course, domestic violence is part of that. But we also might have a sense of abandonment, as I said earlier, where you have a parent who's not capable of taking care of the child because they're, because they're wasted, because they're out of it, because they're not conscious. So believe it or not, long before a child can speak, a child is formulating thoughts about the world around them and what's happening. So if you have a child that is not getting cared for, their clothes are not getting changed. They're not getting bathed. Their diaper's not getting changed. They're not getting fed. They're already developing thoughts about that experience. They can develop the thoughts about, I can't rely on somebody else. I have to take care of myself. And we hear all kinds of stories where kids have rummaged through the kitchen cabinets. Um, eaten the dog food because that's what was available to them because that's what they could reach things like this and of course in a home where we have mental health issues where we have parental addictions where we have domestic violence how's a child supposed to feel safe it's going to be very anxiety provoking what's going to happen next when is it going to happen who's going to get hurt will i get hurt and of course if you've got an environment where this that's scary it's going to be very difficult to feel like you are loved, that you belong, that you are valued, and that you are important. So all these things tend to combine together to create this picture inside a child's head, like I said, even before words are formed. And if you want more proof of that, we know through research that children whose mothers read to them during pregnancy are able to recognize mom's voice 
immediately after birth. And children whose mothers did not read to them during pregnancy do not, are not capable of distinguishing their mom's voice from that of a stranger. So that's really powerful information on our cognitive processes even before we're born. So some of those basic human needs are to feel loved, to feel valued, to feel wanted, respected, needed, important, and listened to. I know from my work in mental health and couples counseling and individual counseling and of course the domestic violence field, so a lot of times people grew up feeling like nobody cares about my opinion, nobody listens to me, I don't feel important, I don't feel wanted, I don't feel valued. So what happens when our needs are not met? Well, as I said earlier before, we develop that hole in our bucket, our emotional bucket. A lot of the good feelings that are naturally inherent to us as human beings are starting to leak out. We're often feeling a sense of emptiness, uh, that lack of belonging, that lack of care. And we might look to other places in order to feel good about ourselves. What kind of feelings do we experience when our needs are not met? Well, I've already listed a few of them. At the same time, we might feel trapped. We might feel stuck. We might feel lost. We might feel confused. We might feel a whole variety of things. And I've never really met anybody coming into counseling that has a whole host of positive feelings, but instead has a very full bucket of negative feelings. So, have you ever turned to an intimate relationship, even a casual relationship, to feel important, to feel valued and needed? Most people have, so congratulations, you're human. Um, sadly, in the work I've done, when girls and boys have been harmed in their lives, in their childhoods, sexually, they often get a very distorted sense of self, a very distorted sense of what love means, and they often turn to sexual behaviors in order to feel positive in their life. But yet, of course, what is it going to bring? It's going to bring more trauma, more baggage, more hurt and pain. Which brings me to the concept of emotional baggage. Most people have heard about it. What exactly is emotional baggage? Most people have heard about things like mommy issues and daddy issues. So we have things like hurt feelings, these unmet emotional needs. We have negative self-esteem, which usually comes with poor self-confidence and also poor self-respect. There's often feelings of abandonment and rejection, feelings of inadequacy and unimportance. And of course, this is going to definitely affect our relationship with ourselves. And most people I've met and worked with did not have a positive relationship with themselves. They didn't treat themselves with self-respect. They did not carry self-confidence. They may engage in a lot of different activities and behaviors that are not healthy for them and actually creating problems. So fear is our greatest motivator. It can motivate us to do things in a positive way. It can also motivate us to do things negatively. Um, what we choose to do is what's going to make the difference. And how far are we willing to go in order to try to protect ourselves and our fears? Will you act positively or potentially negatively? Let's look at the concept of jealousy, which of course is basic insecurity. Jealousy is about fear of loss and ending adequacy. It's often coming from feeling attacked and criticized for being different. We may feel unimportant and ignored, feeling abandoned and rejected, feeling powerless and victimized. So coming back to jealousy. Most people have experienced some jealousy within their relationships. Who is my partner talking to? What are they doing behind my back? Unfortunately, a lot of times people have grown up in families where parents had infidelities and it caused disruption in their family, may have led to divorce. 
And of course, once the parents divorce, or in the process of divorce, there's a lot of conflict that is affecting the children. And that baggage is carried with them when they get into the next relationships. I've met a lot of people who said to themselves, I will never get divorced like my parents did because it ruined my life. And again, if infidelity was a part of that process, one of the things that they will carry in to their next relationships are a fear that my partner will probably cheat on me. And again, if a boyfriend or girlfriend early in life cheated, it will just simply reinforce the negative expectations, the negative beliefs. What happens, of course, then, is that we will act in such a way as to try to protect ourselves. We often find that people will get very invasive, and the cell phone, of course, is one of those places that contains all this information that scares the hell out of me. Who are you talking to? Who are you texting with? Uh, what are you looking at on your phone? Um, who's trying to contact you, and what does that look like? Um, often, we're targeted as by bullies, right? Bullies are usually looking for a sense of power because they often grew up feeling weak. I think most people have heard the concept that a bully was probably bullied at home, and so now what's happening is they're looking for somebody to target so that they can feel strong themselves. Maybe they are trying to impress an abusive parent that made them feel weak and powerless. And often, we might say that bullying is going to come into the intimate partnerships where insecurities become abusive. So speaking of abuse, domestic violence, here's some information on intimate partner violence. Two-thirds of relationships with intimate partner violence are considered mutually combative. That comes from a gentleman named Aaron Saft and his team. They published research back in 2003. Most people are thinking that domestic violence is one directional and historically that has meant severe abuse from a man to a female. Well, that's really true in about 25% of all cases. In about 10% of cases, you have a primarily aggressive female with a passive male. And unfortunately, two thirds of relationships are these mutually combative where people are kind of going at it equally whether it's verbally, mentally, emotionally, and physically. There's a lot of people that get into physical conflict with their partners. And that can look like everything from pushing and pulling, to slapping, to hair pulling, to scratching, and a lot worse than that. Sadly, the statistics on teen dating violence mirror those of adult intimate partner violence. So what does that mean? That means that those same statistics that I just told you fit the same with teen dating violence. And it's been very prevalent. Sadly, most girls have been taught to passively accept abuses because their moms passively accepted them too. Those are things like, well, you know, when you, when you fall in love with somebody, you have to take the good with the bad or take the bad with the good. Um, a lot of times people are living through the bad times waiting for the next good time. Some of the women that I've worked with, of course, had decided at some point that they were going to stop taking it. And a young lady that I worked with came to mind. She sadly grew up with a very abusive father. He did unfortunately kill himself because of his abusive behaviors. He had issues with alcohol. He had issues with cocaine. They moved. And unfortunately, mom continued to date men that were incredibly abusive. And so at some point, this young lady said to herself, I am not going to take this the way my mom took it. It just so happened she was trained in boxing. And so she and her boyfriend, when she was about 16, 17 years old, they were having a disagreement in her bedroom. And I think he must have flinched. But she knocked him out. One, two, three, popped in, knocked him out. Uh, too many men feel like they are entitled to sex and that somehow they think that having sex means that we're good together, but really sexual intimacy has got to be a sign of a healthy relationship. Down here, of course, at the bottom is about 15 to 20% of my court-ordered clients were veterans. 
and I currently work with the U.S. Navy, where I work with Air Force and Navy members, active duty members and their families, and we still see a fairly high prevalence of domestic violence cases, and once again, everybody coming through my office that I'm working with on a professional level did not come from a healthy, happy background. So quality matters. We all deserve to be respected. Now, I've often told people that a good divorce is better than a bad marriage for their children, because too often I've met some really intelligent individuals who weren't able to pursue education because their families were so chaotic that they couldn't mentally and emotionally focus in on academics. A lot of times they turned to their sports as their escape, but unfortunately a lot of times they also turned to drinking and drugging and partying and criminal behaviors, such as vandalism of property and stuff. And I want you to think about this. If 50% of marriages are ending in divorce, how many could have been saved with the right information delivered earlier in life? We know that a lot of times when couples go to seek counseling, it's seven years after the problem began. That was found by a gentleman named Michael Johnson back in 1995. And what they found also is that by the time a couple went to counseling, one person might be trying to save the marriage while the other person was trying to get out of it. So clearly that can't possibly be effective. I've heard a lot of times where marriages have stayed together for the sake of the kids or because of our vows, but yet they really needed to have been divorced long before because they had definitely stayed past the sell-by date or expiration date, as I like to say. And I also like to ask, how many relationships prior to marriage failed? If you think about it, the answer is all of them, right? So. The sad reality is that finding the right partner can be very much a numbers game. And if we are not developing insight, if we are not learning from the patterns that we create, the patterns that we've gone through, um, we're destined to seemingly repeat the same problems even though this new partner has a different name. As my mentors Tracy and Amy once said, if the police get involved in your relationship, something has got to change. And that has been the truth. Um, most people that came into court order counseling were in very firm denial that they had a problem. It was always easier to point the finger and blame their partner for their anger. But they didn't really realize that they were carrying the anger themselves. And again, it was based on all that emotional baggage. Typically, they picked up a very faulty program from their parents in the home that they grew up in. Uh, it has definitely been a part of my work where I am trying to help people understand the program, debug and rewrite the program so that way they can actually have a quality relationship. And I have to say that's been one of the most satisfying aspects of my job is to help people change the dynamics within their family, within their marriage, and actually create a healthy set of dynamics where everybody is feeling comfortable, where everybody's feeling valued and wanted and important and needed. And they were able to move on and have healthy marriages through the rest. So, it's more than just true or false. Most people arrested for domestic violence blame their partner and the police. Sadly, the answer to that is true. Um, one of the things that we do at the end of the counseling when I was working with court-ordered clients was they had to write a letter of accountability to their partner taking responsibility for their abusive actions instead of blaming that partner for their anger and for their actions. Um, ironically, I had several clients claim that um, they were able to thank the police officer who arrested them because it absolutely changed their lives. Next question. Domestic violence. Is it only hitting? Is it black eyes, broken noses, and beatings only? Well, of course, the answer to that is false. We have verbal abuses. We have mental and emotional abuses. We have financial abuse. And unfortunately, we also have sexual abuse. 
true or false fighting is normal it can't be a crime to be angry what do you think well the reality is for my world too many people grew up in a very normal household which became the worst word in my field normal because what they described as normal ultimately was chaos and drama conflict and anger fighting and violence so it's not a crime to be angry however what we do might become a crime and that can be as simple as harassing text messages but often of course it often meant harm to a person destruction of property or threats of harm I've had a lot of people who were arrested for breaking their own property when they're angry. Do you think that is okay? Do you think that's not okay? I mean, if I own my laptop and I break it on the ground, is that not okay? Because what's the consequence of that? Well, besides the fact that I'm gonna have to get myself a new laptop, the emotional effect on the person that I'm there with, right? If I'm breaking my laptop, could I hurt them? If I'm throwing my cell phone, if I'm throwing your cell phone across the room and it's smashed, there's an emotional toil that comes with that. Often, like it says down here, the 100 text messages. Um, I've seen that typically with the younger individuals I worked with on a professional level, where that string of text messages is everything from, I'm sorry, I love you, I'll do anything to get you back, to clearly some pretty nasty caustic words back and forth. And then they flip flop back and forth as well. The reality is with text messaging, and this is something that's important to understand, is the moment somebody says, we're done, stop contacting me, stop trying to communicate with me, stop sending me text messages, the next text message is a crime and that's a crime of harassment because if somebody sets the boundary then ultimately our perpetuating of the text message then becomes the crime because we're violating their boundaries and also substance abuse was involved in at least more than half of all domestic violence arrests typically we're talking alcohol Probably 25% of all arrests were involving marijuana, but they were also another 25% probably involved heavier drugs like cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, and half were alcohol. So relationships are an exchange of emotional energy. How do you respond when you're triggered? Do you take it calmly? Do you give yourself a chance to relax? Do you give yourself a chance to process it? Or do you instantaneously spark? As my mentor, Dr. Walsh, once said, all conflict comes from unmet needs. We talked about our basic human needs earlier in this conversation. Now, I've come to learn not only do all conflicts come from unmet needs, but they also come from competing needs. Often we have two people that want something different and therefore they aren't able to agree on it, etc. So like I said, all conflict comes from unmet needs and competing needs. And moving on please. I happen to have loved math when I was in school, and this is my favorite math equation. Love does not equal chaos plus drama. And yes, we all get angry, but we need anger to be a warning sign and not a weapon. As it says here, there will be challenges ahead. And of course, I don't know how many of you saw the show Beef or the, t or the movie Anger Management. But clearly there was a lot of scenes in there where people probably could have made a better choice if they had just allowed themselves to calm down and take a different approach. So in terms of anger, I like to teach people about concept of level of agitation. 
and I ask, where does explosion happen? So it says, anger needs to be a warning sign that something is not right. This may have to do with a boundary violation, your expectations not being met, or your needs not met. The process of controlling emotions involves insight and recognition that your level of agitation is increasing. Too often, people aren't paying enough attention to what's happening inside their body. They feel themselves escalate. They just allow it to happen until they pop and explode. Um, we need to do something where we intervene for ourselves because a lot of times, if somebody turns around and says, hey, you need to calm down, that's not gonna work. Most people just get seemingly more agitated with that. What we want to do is we want to learn to take a time out or take a break from the conflict because that allows us to disengage from the moment. Kind of like the smoking break when you're at work, right? People get stressed out. They decide to walk away from their work in order to go have a cigarette. It gives them a break because they walked away. They thought about other things and then they go back to their job. Now, the one problem with the whole cigarette break, of course, is that nicotine is a major stimulant, and so now it seems to wind people back up, and they may get stressed a little bit faster. Maybe we'll be coming back to this, but ultimately, there is a reason why the cigarette break works as well as not only just the disengaging, but actually about the controlled breathing. The whole concept of taking the time out is to give ourselves a chance to calm down and figure out what's wrong in our minds because the more agitated we get the less clear we are able to think the less clear we are able to communication uh, to communicate so as it says where does explosion occur a lot of people want to think that on a scale of 0 to 10 ad explosion is happening up there at the 10 because it's the top of the scale but the fact of the matter is it's really happening at the 7 Seven is the point of no, no return. And healthy communication. Healthy communicating is helping, happening at the one, two, and three level. Because that's the only place in which we're calm enough to be able to think clearly, express ourselves clearly, listen to the other party, negotiate and compromise, as opposed to just trying to get what we want, or trying to discount and ignore the other things the other person's saying. What's happening in between them? Well, what's happening in there is we're getting physiological um, escalations happening. So, physiological changes are happening at the fore. We're talking about increased heart rate. We're talking about increased blood pressure. We're talking about feeling kind of hot under the collar and sweaty, perhaps. Um, Sometimes people pace, sometimes people clench their fists, sometimes people clench their jaw. And while that's all happening, they're escalating up. The other thing that's happening while they're in there is somewhere in this area here, they're getting a lot of negative thinking that's happening. It's not coming out of their mouth, but they're thinking a lot of negative stuff. And seven has been identified by my clients as that point of no return. This is where verbal abuse is going to start. And at an eight, you're going to have more intense verbal abuse. So you have these two different levels, eight and seven for verbal abuse, and then physical abuse starts here at the nine. And clearly, the 10 is going to be even more physically abusive. So maybe down here at a nine, well, let's just start at the seven. This could be yelling and screaming. This could be shouting. Uh, could be shutting people down, not listening to them. 10 may involve the insults and the name calling and all the expletives. Physical abuse could be moving things out of the way like a coffee table. It could be throwing things. It could be breaking a phone. And then of course we also are going to get into things like slapping, pushing, pulling, maybe hair pulling. And 10 is going to be more severe. We're talking about punching. We're talking about choking. Um, somewhere in there is going to be things like punching holes in walls, slamming doors, 
kicking holes in doors, etc. Now what's important to understand is that behaviors are an attempt to change how we feel inside. So if I'm jealous and I'm making accusations that you're cheating on me, what am I trying to change? Am I trying to get reassurance that you're doing not doing me wrong? Or by using accusations, am I thinking that you're going to change your behaviors and stop? If I'm looking through your cell phone for information, I am trying to, again, either find information that reinforces what I'm fearing, or I'm looking for information that just might reassure me. Physical abuses, again, are a way to try to control the situation and control the person while I am not able to really control my emotional state. What most people don't realize is that talking is a behavior. Yelling and screaming is a behavior. Name calling is a behavior. But talking is a behavior. Silence is also a behavior. Now silence can be valuable in that time out because I am not saying anything. I'm not saying anything harmful. But we also know that the cold shoulder and purposely cutting somebody off and not talking to them for days, that kind of silence, that is actually mentally and emotionally abusive. We understand that it's probably going to get under their skin and therefore I'm going to use that as some sort of leverage. A lot of times we are afraid to be judged and rejected, right? Sometimes people get a little bit stuck up and full of themselves. And a lot of times that's kind of an arrogant self-protection. Uh, sometimes they're afraid to admit that they're wrong, etc. Now sometimes we do pick positive behaviors. Sometimes we unfortunately pick unhealthy behaviors. So for instance, if I was potentially jealous that you could be interested in finding a different relationship that you might be interested in leaving me I need to find out why and I need to go ask myself that if I recognize that I'm not treating you positively then the answer would be to learn to calm myself down learn how to communicate better and most definitely do positive things that would make you want to stay Again, unfortunately, in a lot of times, people are picking the unhealthy behaviors, such as the accusations, stalking behaviors, um, going through somebody's phone, etc. Okay? We're so afraid to be hurt that, unfortunately, a lot of times we fight. Sometimes we fight silently, but regardless of which, we are always hurting. And healthy relationships are not about hurting. Healthy relationships are about encouragement and support. Sometimes it's about doing small things to make somebody feel important, to feel valued, to feel needed, to feel wanted. And we don't do that in a selfish way. We have to learn how to do it in a way that's positive for them. So again, unhealthy behaviors, how do we react? mean angry text messages yelling and screaming shouting etc what is it exactly we're trying to communicate well usually we're trying to communicate fear usually we're trying to communicate hurt and pain a lot of times again this is based on what was normal in the house we grew up with so what kind of programming did you receive regarding conflict and communication how did your parents deal with conflicts what did they teach you about discussing difficult topics? Did they acknowledge your expectations, your feelings, your painful experiences? Did they yell and cuss at each other? Did they blame each other for everything? Was it always one direction or was it going mutually? So what should I communicate? Your words have power. What do we need to communicate? Well, ultimately, we need to communicate about our feelings. 
and what people haven't really understood is that most of the times in the families where we grow up we were not taught how to identify the emotions and feelings we have based on the situation because ultimately as kids we need somebody to teach us oh so this is what was happening so this is probably what you were feeling and then you have to be taught how to talk about them it's been all too normal in my work where people were not taught these words and were not taught healthy communication patterns so if you're not taught the words to use how are you supposed to do it and for boys it's particularly worse from the standpoint of we were often taught that you shouldn't express your feelings that somehow that will be a weakness that it will be a vulnerability that these things will get used against you so secondary feelings with this emotional iceberg are the things that are showing above the water and unfortunately again one of the things that we are taught that it's okay to say you're sad but it's definitely been okay to say that you're angry and show your anger we were not taught how to express those primary feelings which are under the surface and of course I never get to work with anybody because they're excessively happy the whole reason that people are coming to counseling is that they have a whole host of negative feelings that are causing their anger, causing their depression, and often both. So what kind of negative feelings can you name based on relationships that you've had in your life with your friends and with your family? A lot of times people have felt jealous, lost, torn, and hurt, ignored, alone, and unimportant, unwanted, that they are not good enough and not good enough definitely fits in a lot of times with the whole jealousy and fear of losing a relationship because if I'm not good enough you're going to leave me often people have felt embarrassed and get very angry about that or of course they get angry when they're betrayed or feel disrespected a lot of times boys in particular have gotten very angry when they feel powerless especially when they feel accused okay of course we can feel very depressed and anxious if we feel like we are somehow different than the others that we are feeling judged and criticized bullied misunderstood etc etc so what happens if I don't communicate well the reality is that we're going to either explode or implode we're going to experience a lot of anger and depression and if we the more we bottle it up the more likely are we are to go off volcanically so to speak we'll feel trapped and we'll feel confused we're gonna feel very fragmented broken and shattered we must learn to communicate about our feelings our thoughts our expectations our needs and our fears if we don't learn to communicate nobody can crawl inside your head to figure out what you're going through and in a healthy relationship my ability to explain these things to you means that you have the ability to listen to me process them and respond in a way that's going to be helpful which again if we learn to communicate like this and we do not get the positive responses from a partner they may be telling you everything you need to know about the quality of your relationship especially with them so what should I communicate again our fears our feelings our needs our frustrations we need to learn to identify and communicate those feelings our needs boundaries boundaries are incredibly important in relationships we need to be able to communicate them this is going to be acceptable and this is not going to be acceptable we often need to be able to identify an, an appropriate consequence that if you violate my boundary, this is what's going to happen. I can use the extreme very easily. If you cheat on me again, I'm going to get out of this relationship. But boundary violations can be everything from financial issues to helping each other out to supporting each other. Uh, there's a whole variety of boundaries. We need to learn how to set them. 
We need to learn how to communicate those consequences. And then we need to learn to deal with one another. So, we must learn to communicate and we need to do it nicely. We need to learn how to do it with respect. It can't be yelling and screaming and shouting. It cannot be cussing and name calling. It cannot be about discounting and invalidating somebody else's perspective. So this is supposedly the magic formula. These are called the I feel statements. I feel, insert emotion here, when you do this, that, or the other, because. Now the because is gonna vary. It's usually linked to the past hurts. It can be linked to past people. So something like, I feel anxious when I don't hear from you for several days because I don't understand what that means about our relationship. I felt scared when you didn't call me when I expected you to because I heard that there was a lot of snow and ice on the roads and I knew you were driving home. I feel rejected when you insult me in front of your friends because that reminds me of feeling criticized and attacked when I was a child. So there's a lot of ways in which this is gonna work, but this is the formula to learning to communicate properly. And we need to change how we think about conflict. If you grew up in a caustic, toxic home, Typically, you were taught that conflict is how we solve problems, that's how we were supposedly going to communicate our feelings, and that somehow if you win the argument, you were somehow right. So we want to learn to adopt more positive beliefs around conflict and communication, and we need to understand that healthy communication is a part of setting healthy boundaries. Again, we need to stop trying to win. We need to listen. We don't have to shout. We need to be respectful. And we need to somehow find mutual decisions where each person feels like they are getting something beneficial from the moment, from the solutions that we identify. So this is often about compromise. It's about negotiation. So communication skills. It does not matter what we fight about, it's how we fight that matters. Let that sink in a minute. We teach others how to treat us. So as terms of personalities, often we typically either adopt a passive approach to dealing with conflict or potentially an aggressive approach to dealing with conflict. And believe it or not, there's a lot of similarities between both of those from the standpoint of what we feel on the inside. A passive individual is afraid of conflict. They're afraid of offending somebody else. Well, on the flip side of that equation, somebody who acts very aggressively is also afraid of conflict because they're afraid of dealing with something. They don't know how to communicate, but they know how to be angry. And a lot of times what they're doing is they're using their anger to try to shut down a conflict so I don't have to deal with it. So if I'm passive, I might invite you to be passive where we don't talk about anything, where we don't deal with anything. If I'm passive, I might teach you to be aggressive where you dominate and control me. If I'm aggressive, I might be teaching you to passively back away from me so that we don't have to deal with anything. Or, if I'm aggressive, I might be teaching you that it's okay to be aggressive in return. And again, behaviors are a means to change and control how we feel. So again, we've used, in, we've used insecurity around loss of relationship an awful lot. But a lot of times, again, it's feeling like I'm out of control, and so how do I find ways to feel in control? Am I the one making all the decisions? Am I the one spending the money? Am I the one who is dictating what other people have to do? And how you communicate is definitely a behavior. 
Are you going to do it passively? Are you going to do it aggressively? Or are you going to learn to do it assertively? So I like to ask, what are barriers to effective communication? Well, there's controlling methods like interrupting, talking over the top of others, not allowing others to speak. Somehow having the last word is somehow hashtag winning. But one thing to understand is that if you set out to win a relationship argument, or sorry, to win an argument, the relationship is going to suffer. Somebody is going to leave with their tail tucked between their legs and feeling bad about themselves. Silence and withdrawal, that cold shoulder, sulking, avoiding issues. Somehow that is punishing and also it can be a setup. I once worked with a gang member, his name was Terrence. And when he would get upset, what he would do is he would go sulk and withdraw to the bedroom. And this is where it became a setup for his girlfriend. If she came to check on him to see what was wrong, then that was his opportunity to go off on her and, and yell and scream and cuss her out and tell her everything she did wrong. If she gave him space and did not come to check up on him, then he got mad and acted like she didn't care and love him, and so he'd go off on her anyway. Twisting the words of others is definitely a barrier to effective communication. We need to listen to understand, not listen to counter a point and counter argue, etc. The kitchen sink. Some people are familiar with this concept. The kitchen sink is where basically we are taking everything and throwing it into an argument. Instead of looking at one topic at a time, dealing with it, and then if we have the chance, moving on to something else. So a lot of times one of the things that happens is that you will get a person who holds on to everything and is not talking about it because they're too passive and afraid. When they finally go off, they go off about everything. Everything that they've been brooding about and holding on to, they're throwing into this argument. So there's no traction made on any topic. And a lot of times we're just jumping from one topic to another. The flip side of that is it can be used as a defensive weapon, whereas you're trying to talk to me about topic A, we're not getting anywhere, and so I'm going to start throwing out topics to try to put you on the defensive, and I'm going to try to keep shifting what we're talking about so that way nothing's ever, desert, uh, sorry, nothing's ever resolved and dealt with. Other barriers to effective communication. The defensiveness and deflection, like I just mentioned. Lacking accountability, which means usually blaming others, using the counterattack, and even lying. Wrong time, wrong place, and distractions. It is important for us not to be having difficult conversations at the dinner table or at the breakfast table. We don't want to be doing it out in public. We sure as heck don't need to have distractions going on like all the children and their homework and the TV and telephone calls. You know, set the cell phones down when you're having to have a discussion. Pick a good time and place to do it. Negotiate on that. Let's not do it every single night. Let's pick once a week to have the difficult discussions. Where we do want to talk on a nightly basis is how was your day? anything of interest happening, what's going on. Just getting in contact and sharing how your day went. Clearly lacking empathy for another person is going to be a barrier because if I lack empathy for you, I don't care what you have to say. I don't care what your needs are. I don't have compassion. And without empathy and compassion, there's probably going to be a difficult time getting anywhere positive. And then obviously, anger, right? Other barriers to effective communication, being abusive, using emotional abuse, threats to harm self or others. We often find that people will threaten to hurt themselves, kill themselves in order to try to control somebody because I'm afraid you're leaving me, or I'm afraid I'm not good enough. And that's becoming a very effective method to keep somebody from going. 
mental abuse such as the distrust and constant false accusations, reading too much into things and leading to misinterpretations. Clearly, physical abuse is always going to be a barrier to effective communication. When should I communicate? Well, you need to communicate when you're calm, not when you're angry. Learn to take a time out so that way you can calm down and come back to a discussion. You don't want to let yourself escalate through that cycle of 0 through 10 where you start to go off. We need to pick a good time to do it. So not just before work, as I said earlier, not at the breakfast or dinner table, and definitely not before bed. I like to say, nothing good ever happens behind after 10 o'clock in terms of a conflict and argument. Again, unless we're happy with each other. Never communicate when intoxicated because barriers and inhibitions are going to be lowered where I'm more likely to say or do the wrong thing. Assertive communication is the answer. And what we're looking for is we're looking for clear and concise, firm but fair, it's respectful. We're learning to express our needs, we're learning how to communicate boundaries, and we're good at listening also. So healthy relationships have to start on the inside. This is about healthy self-esteem, self-confidence, positive self-respect. We need to learn to do little things because they help build traction. They help build momentum. We need to learn to do the right things and not the wrong things. Words have power, so don't say something that you think you're going to regret later. I mean, how many times has somebody put their foot in their mouth and wish they could take it back? All the time. I like to joke, it's better to have stitches in your tongue, which means you bit your tongue instead of saying the wrong thing, versus having another dose of athlete's mouth from putting your foot in it. It's okay to say you're not okay. You know what? I'm not in a good place to talk. I think I need some time. I need some time to process this. I need some time to figure out what I'm feeling, what my needs are, the boundaries, etc. I just need some time. If you have to, write it down. Sometimes it's easier to write things down as far as what you need to communicate and come back to it later. And sometimes it's even valuable to read it right off the page because sometimes once we start getting into that difficult conversation and our feelings start getting wound up, our our energy takes over and we start to say the wrong thing again. If you have to read it off the page, read it off the page. You probably did a good job of censoring and editing it, so it's a starting point. A lot of times we have to start there and then we get better at just our oral communication. Characteristics of a healthy relationship. Boy, I tell you what, it's easy to know what's wrong. It's easy to say um, what isn't working, but yet we still stick with it. But sometimes people don't even know what it really means to have a healthy relationship. These things are part of it. So it's important to respect each other's opinions and definitely follow through with things that you say you're going to do. Don't agree to something when you really don't mean to do it. Don't try to just placate somebody expecting them to forget about it. They won't. Have positive intentions. A lot of times people don't understand that really a healthy relationship is about teamwork. A lot of times people don't enter relationships understanding that it needs to be teamwork. And some more. Emotional space. We need to be able to give each other emotional space when it's valued and needed because we're not doing conflict right. Of course, it's important to have some similar interests. And at the same time, it's going to be important at some point that it's OK to have time away from each other with other people and other friends.
It's a partnership. We need to be able to encourage each other and support each other. Again, we need to have those healthy boundaries. We need to accept the fact that we have some differences. We need to develop a concept of interdependent, which means I can rely on you and rely on me, but this isn't codependent, it's not independent. And some others, we need to have confidence in each other. Empathy, truthfulness, don't push each other's buttons. Don't purposely go after somebody. We need to care about each other's needs and feelings. We need to allow for vulnerability and we need to be accountable. It is important that we are able to spend time apart without insecurities. And a lot of times we need to realize that this person is supposed to be our friend. So healthy relationships are a full-time job. You need to work at it. It takes a lot of time to get it right. It takes a lot of consciousness to get it right. So again, what was normal in your house growing up? You don't have to follow that script. You can rewrite it. It does not matter what you fight about. It's how you fight that matters. Right? We teach others how to treat us. So I ask all of you to be the pebble in the pond. I ask you to spread peace. And I founded Students and Athletes for Healthy Relationships because I've worked with adults for so long. I've worked with plenty of teens too over my career. And since we already identified that the same patterns that we grow up with often become the patterns that we follow. One of the beauties about working with teenagers was that the information resonated. It hadn't been covered over with layers and years and decades of adult life and bullshit, as I like to say. So I've been trying to, I want to teach teenagers what I've been trying to teach their parents so that way they can avoid the pitfalls in programming so that they can have better lives by being conscious sooner in life. Now, at STARS, we believe in inclusion because the sad reality is that bullying is often based on fear over differences in between us. We encourage students to live their lives in healthy and self-respecting ways. We want everyone to know that they deserve healthy relationships and to never settle for less than full respect, and also that they have to give respect to. So I would love it if you would follow us on Instagram, Join our Facebook group, Stars Against Violence. You can follow me on LinkedIn, and we do have a YouTube channel with a variety of things on it. I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate you being with me. I hope this has been valuable to you. Uh, I love being part of this uh, Pave the Way Mental Health Summit with the Be Daring Foundation, and I'm ever so grateful for Michelle DeMaria for bringing me on board. Thanks again. Take care.